So again, good morning, everyone. My name is Bert Covert, I'm the chair of the American Society of Primatologists Conservation Committee. And I welcome you to the ASP Conservationist webinar today, along with the co-chair of the Conservation Committee, Dr. Jennifer Kramer. Today's program was conceived and organized by Dr. Marilyn Norcock, the past chair of our committee, and Jennifer and I thank Marilyn for her leadership in this endeavor. The ASP Conservationist Award is given out annually and provides recognition and financial support for students and early career investigators from habitat countries who demonstrate potential for making significant and continuing contributions to primate conservation. Nearly 25 individuals have been, received this award since 1997, and these folks are important leaders of conservation efforts in their countries and regions. We are quite fortunate to have six recipients of this award with us today. Personally, I am in awe of the work they do in primate conservation. They truly are individuals who are making significant and continuing contributions to conservation efforts. These honored, these honored guests will each give a brief presentation that will introduce you to the wonderful conservation work they are doing. We'll have a question and answer session at the end of these presentations. And I encourage those in the audience to submit questions in the chat at any time. And we'll pose these questions during the question and answer session at the end of today's meeting. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on the ASP Conservation Committee YouTube site within a few days of the event. Finally, as most of you are aware, we, are, we have been actively seeking donations to the Saving Primates Where They Live campaign since the beginning of September. Funds we raise are being matched by Rewild, so your donations are being doubled. We have a goal of $25,000, and we're right at $20,000 now. I hope we can raise at least $1,000 at today's event. These funds will provide grants of up to $5,000 for Habitat Country Primatologists such as our speakers today, whose work directly protects primates, help conserve overall biodiversity, and sustainable into the future. And Jennifer and Marilyn, could one of you put the link to the Give Butter site into the chat? Yep, I'll put it in there uh, as we get started with Andy in just a second. Great, great. And, um, and I really appreciate Jennifer's uh, leadership on this. She's much more talented at multitasking than I am. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first speaker now. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andy Ong, the 2019 recipient of the Conservation Award. Dr. Dr. Ong is from Singapore, where she is a Mandai nature research scientist and the chairperson of Raffles Banded Langer Working Group. She works mainly in Singapore, but also works on projects in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. These projects target Asian colobines, particularly Raffles Banded Langers in Singapore and Malaysia, East Sumatran Banded Langers in Indonesia, and Indochinese Silver Langers in Vietnam. Her team also works to conserve long-tailed macaques in Singapore and Malaysia. I've had the pleasure, pleasure of knowing Andy for a decade now, and I've continually been um, extremely impressed with her conservation efforts and her energy um, towards primate conservation and towards um, biodiversity conservation in, in, in general. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Andy Ong to um, today's event. Andy, take it away. Thank you so much, Bert. Has it been a decade? <laughs> so let me share my screen. See? All right. Um, thank you so much, Bert, for the introduction and to ASP for the award and this opportunity to participate in the webinar to share more about how the funds from the award were used, uh, my current projects and the plans ahead. So this is a photo of a Raffles Banded Langer, which is a critically endangered primate found only in Singapore and Malaysia. Since graduating from University of Colorado Boulder under the supervision of BIRD, I've been focusing on the conservation and research of this uh, Banded Langers in Singapore and Malaysia. 
since 2016, a working group called the Raffles Bandelanger Working Group was formed with partners in Singapore and Malaysia and also from the region to um, look at how we can protect this species in the wild and their habitats to gather key information through research and collaboration. And lastly, to ensure that we have necessary resources in terms of funding and also commitments from individuals and agencies to ensure the long-term conservation of this species. Besides going to the field to carry out field work and carrying out molecular analysis in the lab, we started to go out to the field to climb trees since about a year and a half ago. So part of the funds from the award went into supporting uh, myself, my team, to go through this tree climbing course to ensure that we are able to manually climb the trees safely. And part of the funds also went into uh, purchasing some of the climbing equipment and for preparation work, as you can see from this photo. And also supporting uh, the purchase of uh, additional units of camera traps. So this is how it looks like. Um, we are a team of four tree climbers, including myself. And we would be planning um, the location of where the camera trap would be with the authorities in Singapore, which is the National Parks Board. So once we have selected a, a tree, which is safe to climb, we'll be climbing up to install our cameras and regularly about once a month, but sometimes it might be once in two months, depending on the weather and COVID restrictions. We will be climbing the trees to check our SD card uh, to check whether the location was optimal, whether there's any need to change the settings and so on. So we can actually use um, the camera traps that were set up within the habitat to monitor not just the Raffles banded langers, but also other species in the area. So besides manually climbing trees, we also had to hire cherry picker cranes for locations which are next to the roads. Um, this is part of the regulation and guidelines from the national agencies um, for safety purposes. So you can see here that um, we also had to hire the cranes to bring us up about 15 to 18 meters above uh, ground to install cameras and to check the cameras regularly. And these are some of the images that we have captured so far. On the top right, we have a colugo, which is a gliding mammal. And in the daytime, in the nighttime, it's really difficult to see this animal. So with the installation of camera traps, it can really help us to monitor um, their occurrences and their behavior. And then at the bottom right, we also have a flying squirrel. Similarly as the colugo, if we do not install camera traps, it'd be very difficult to collect data on this species. And then oftentimes we'll come across images like this where the animal gets too close and uh, you'll be wondering what animal this might be. And over time, we learned that it's one of our good friends who will always show up in our camera traps wherever they were set up. And it's a long tail macaque. It's only after three months of trial and error, you know, figuring out the sensitivity of the camera traps that we managed to capture our target species, which is the Raffles Vendelang. And so here uh, is an example of um, an instance where we managed to capture Singapore's three native species of primates on the same tree. So we have on the left, the Sunda slow loris, and in the middle, the long-tailed macaque, followed by the Raffles Bandelang. So this showcase how um, different species are utilizing the same area at different times. And since 2019, um, Singapore has the fourth species of non-human primate, which is not native, and is the dusky langer. Uh, we believe that two dusky langers managed to get across from southern Malaysia to Singapore um, to the causeway, which is only less than one kilometer apart. So they either swam across or walked on the causeway on the pavement. And then they showed up in our camera traps. Um, and unlike the long-term macaques or the banded langer, the dusky langers are especially curious about this weird looking cameras that are on the trees. To the point that whenever they come across a camera, they will try their very best to bring them down. And so over the course of one and a half years that we have started setting up the cameras, we installed 12 cameras so far. 
and they have managed to find six of them and took down all six of them. So part of the funds actually went into helping to send these cameras for repair. And uh, we're thinking of buying all those protective, um, I think there are some cases where we can actually use to protect the camera traps. In this case, hopefully it can work against the dusky lightness. So what I've presented so far uh, is mainly to serve goal number two of the Species Action Plan of the Raffles Bandit Lang Working Group, which is to gather key information through research. Um, but a lot of what we focus on is uh, also community involvement and uh, in particular, the citizen science program since 2016. So you can see here, every six months, we would be conducting a volunteer recruitment workshop to train volunteers on how to do data collection, um, where to go out to nature trails to find the langers and also other species of um, plants and animals. Um, so we're hoping that uh, we are able to also do this citizen science program, not only, not just in Singapore, but in Malaysia and Indonesia as well, moving ahead. Uh, this is how it looks like, uh, even though we we're all hit by the pandemic since last year. Whenever there were opportunities, um, when there were easing of the restrictions, the citizen scientists would still be going out there, uh, of course, you know, following the guidelines in order to continue to monitor the lanyards. Um, so I would like to close off by saying that a lot of the research that we do depends on you know, multiple agencies, various individuals, uh, researchers and stakeholders. As you can see here, we will have the funding agencies, we have, we have the education institutions, we have NGOs and national agencies, you know, locally and also regionally. And so researchers really require support um, in various forms, whether it's financially or through collaboration. So I'd um, like to appeal for support to these individuals and researchers through um, you know, supporting ESP. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. That was a wonderful presentation. And now it's time for Krista to introduce William. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Krista Millich, and I'm an assistant professor of anthropology at Washington University in St. Louis. My primate conservation work in Uganda helped me to become familiar with the work of our next speaker, Dr. William Olipot. Dr. Olipot is the executive director of Nature and Livelihoods, an indigenous Ugandan NGO developing and implementing research and livelihood projects that support nature conservation. He was our ASP conservationist award winner in 2004. Dr. Olipot has conducted research across all of Uganda's national parks and has been a key figure in conducting primary research that informs conservation management strategies. He does this work by working with both wildlife and communities. He has amassed an impressive list of publications. I know his work best from uh, his research on manga bees in Kibali National Park, but he's also studied uh, the human wildlife interface around Windy National Park, as well as forest restoration efforts in Uganda, and much more. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. William Olipot. Oh, hi. Um, I'm, I'm having a screen issue. Um, I don't know if you're seeing the slide I'm trying to share. We don't we saw, see it. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to say, we, we did. Oh, there you go. Yep. If you can just put it on full screen, then you're all set. Oh, Thanks, William. Oh, okay. I, I, I apologize for that. Um, Perfect. And because there's, there's poor lighting here, maybe I, sh I, should, I should turn off the video, something like that. Maybe that, is that okay? I, I think you're like okay. I'm, yeah, we can see you. Okay. okay. Yeah, yep. you look great. Oh, fine. Oh, thank you, Krista, for that very generous introduction. And hello, everyone. And thank you uh, for giving me your time. 
I'll begin this uh, presentation by explaining how I used the award. I received the award in 2004, and it helped me to start up local arrangements for Uganda to host the 21st Congress of the International Primatological Society. Specifically, the award helped facilitate my reaching out to key local stakeholders and to form a local arrangement scheme. So currently, uh, maybe in addition, slightly in addition to uh, what Krista explained, uh, I work for that the non nonprofit. I can confirm that for sure, and it it works inside and outside protected areas. And um, addressing the issue of habitat degradation and lo species loss. The work spans various ecosystems, which include forests, uh, traditional farmlands, and wetlands. Most of my primate conservation work it currently focuses on mangroves of the subspecies Lophosiba salpigena ugandae. Uh, the subspecies is near endemic to Uganda. Uh, its range is shown here in enclosed within the map by a solid brown line. So if I can show it, if I can point at it. So th this is, this line represents the range of um, Uganda Mangabe. And the sites it occurs are Kibale National Park here, Bugoma Central Forest Reserve here, Mabira Central Forest Reserve here. Um, those are the major populations. The smaller population occurs are about here. Uh, in Sango Bay, which extends a little bit into Northern Tanzania. However, there's a lot of pressure on their habitat. As you can see, it's just four populations that I think are viable remaining. Particularly in forest reserves, there's a lot of pressure and the forest reserves are indicated here by uh, the, the solid uh, green shadings and the light green shadings represent national parks. The largest uh, population occurs in Kibale National Park, uh, followed by those in Bugoma and Mabira Central Forest Reserve. So I currently work uh, uh, to conserve the subpopulation in Mabira. Central Forest Reserve. And the projects have implemented are, are quite many. And they really, I'm sorry, my, uh, I'm getting an indication my internet connection is unstable, so you may not be getting very well. Uh, but I was, as I was saying, the projects group into three types. Uh, there's the community outreach and support as the first group of projects. And we had well over 20 projects of that kind um, during the period 2015 to 2019 when we were supported by the MacArthur Foundation. And then the second group of projects is uh, co-tourism promotion. And then the other group is action research. So here is an example on the left, uh, a picture of um, uh, a community support activity. Um, here in the foreground, uh, wearing a light shirt and a cap. And these two people are the area members of parliament. And they're just there to raise awareness. Um, uh, launching, we're launching the garbage dump that we constructed uh, for local communities to stop dumping garbage in the forest. So are, the garbage dump probably wasn't very expensive, but their presence was very good to raise for raising awareness. Um, the second photograph here shows uh, the, um, uh, the guides, the tourism guides we train and equip. And um, the third one represents action research uh, with me there standing and uh, wearing a cup. So action research, you know, by my definition, for the, the purpose of this project is uh, the research that um, identifies threats and highlights them where necessary and also provides remedies uh, to address the threats. So here are the various 
uh, examples of the various projects that we implemented with the local communities. And, and, and here's the, gab, uh, the garbage jump I was talking about uh, that we constructed. And um, here's an example of uh, a beekeeping activity, uh, poultry, piggery. And um, here is a group of uh, beneficiaries of one group, uh, of the many groups we supported around Mabira from the forest uh, reserve. Actually, we supported more than, I think, 20 groups, more than 20. Um, so they are holding their signpost. Um, and you can see in the signpost that the uh, project was funded by the MacArthur Foundation. And for research, uh, uh, as I say, there are actually about 11 projects. I mentioned 10, but there are 11. And they group into three, three types, uh, four types. Uh, threat assessment, habitat restoration, human wildlife conflict reduction, uh, ecotourism related projects. And um, all of these provide recommendations um, that management can really directly act upon uh, to improve habitat conservation. We don't have a problem of uh, hunting uh, for primates. There is a problem of hunting antelopes in, um, in, the, in the forest reserves in Uganda. Uh, there is some hunting going on, but uh, that is directly related to human wildlife conflict, which arises from habitat loss. So uh, people clear a forest, the monkeys don't have anywhere to forage. They forage in the fields that have been cleared. As a result, there is a conflict which leads to killing of animals. But in places where the forest loss has not happened, the, the conflicts are usually minimal. So my long-term conservation goals are to, uh, uh, they're not going to change from, from what I'm doing now, which is to continue contributing to saving primates and their habitats. And I will also continue to conserve and uh, implement a project that's, that conserve biodiversity generally, whatever it occurs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, William, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, really impressive work, really impressive work. And now it's time for Eric to introduce our next speaker. We can't hear you, Eric. No, <laughs> can't hear you. Eric, you're unmuted, so I don't know. Have you checked your microphone source? Eric was talking a lot in our practice before. Uh, Jennifer, were you going to show Mammy's recording? I am. Do you think I should do that uh, first? Well, let's see. Travis has said he'd be happy to introduce Mammy. Um, can, can you hear me oh, now? Yeah, there you are. It was on a microphone setting that, anyway, uh, <laughs> greetings. Sorry for that. I'm Dr. Eric Patel from the Lemur Conservation Foundation, joining you virtually from the mountains of Maro Jeji. I'm delighted today to introduce Mr. Mami Razafit Salama, who was awarded the ASP Conservationist Prize in 2015. He works in Northwestern Madagascar in the dry forests of Ankara Fonseca National Park, 
which is the only protected area where critically endangered mongoose lemurs exist, as well as endangered cockerel sifakas. In fact, Mami's master's thesis at the University of Antananarivo focused on the behavior and ecology of this flagship species. Back in 2013, he helped to start the organization Planet Madagascar and currently serves as their Madagascar country director and operations manager. He manages all aspects of their Madagascar programs, including negotiating with the government, working with local communities, and overseeing their finances. In 2019, he was selected by Durell Wildlife Trust for their Conservation Academy in Mauritius. And just last year, he was selected again for Durell's, Durell's Endangered Species Management Program in Jersey, British Islands. Thank you very much, Mommy. We look forward to your presentation. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Eric, for uh, introducing me and uh, for the opportunity on taking part of this uh, webinar. Today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, ISP Safar in 2015, our current work, and my long term goal. Madagascar is a hotspot country, which means country with uh, high endemism coupled with uh, high threats as well. Habitat loss because of uh, fire is the biggest threat to biodiversity in Ankara Franska National Park. In 2015, we kicked off our fire management project to alleviate fire within our management zone. And in 2015 as well, I won the ISP Conservationist Award. The fund that I received from ISP help support our fire management project by creating fire break to buffer fire within our management zone. I chose working with uh, Planet Madagascar as we share the same hope and vision on saving limus and improving life of local community in and around Ankara Franska National Park. We have three projects including fire management project, forest restoration project, and community development. Since 2015 and every year, we clean up around 15 kilometers of fire break to stop fire and to protect lemurs and their natural habitat against fire. Since 2015, we have 18 local community per year to do patrols within the management zone. We have three teams of six people and each team conduct four patrols per week. Every year we host a responsible fire day to educate the people how to protect forest and animals and what is the relationship between forest and animal and human. And uh, finally, how to burn safely if they have to burn for their agriculture. And we fight fire when it appears within our uh, management zone or within Ankara Franska National Park. Now, let's move to our forest restoration project. We collected seeds with the local community members. We planted only native trees as we work inside the national park. We produced seedlings within nursery. Now we have five nursery and each nursery can produce around eight to ten thousand of seedlings. Since 2018, we have been planted around 65,000 of trees. And this, com for this coming planting season, 
we will plant at least 40,000 of trees. Now, let's uh, move to what we do for the community. We created activity that generated income such as beehives and citrus production. We trained 15 community members on how to care and produce honey. And at the end of the training, we share 10 tips per person. Also, we provided 150 siblings within 15 community members. In 2017, we helped create a woman cooperative that focused on siblings production, tree plantation, and uh, to reduce the impact of erosion within the community, but also to improve food security. Finally, through Psychology Funds, we are building a school in one of our community in Andranohubata to improve the quality of education and to improve the next generation. Now let's see my long-term goals. I hope that 60% of the savanna landscape within our management zone will be restored by 2017. Local community will be able to manage their own natural resources. And education level improved by at least 30%. And finally, poverty will be reduced within our management zone. Before I finish my part, I would like to invite you to donate generously to ISP to save primates where they live and to support their initiative in terms of research and conservation projects around the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mame. And when I went to share your video, I realized you were also saying hello. So I just want to let everybody know that you're here today um, and you'll be available at the end to um, answer questions or answer questions in chat. Yes, hello everyone. And uh, uh, you can uh, ask a question and I will uh, answer you later. Thank you. Thank you, Mammy. So Jennifer, it's time to share another slide here, it looks like. Yes, it is. So I'm, I'm overwhelmed here. What impressive work by Andy, William, and Mammy it's readily apparent why they received the Conservationist Award. Their work obviously directly protects primates, helps conserve overall diversity, is sustainable into the future, and, and much, much more. So really impressive work. Now, reminder, we are actively seeking donations to the Saving Primate, Primates Where They Live campaign, a program that will support habitat country primatologists um, and again, Andy, William, and Mammy are three wonderful examples of habitat country primatologists. Um, and as you can see that we have representatives from um, around the world. We've had a uh, representative from Asia, from Afri Africa, from Madagascar. And, um, and again, um, on this slide here, it gives directions on how to give money to this uh, program. And um, I'm gonna move on now to uh, introduce our next speaker. I, I am honored to introduce um, Ms. Mariani Ramley of Malaysia, the 2018 recipient of the Conservation Award. In 2016, she founded the Gibbon Protection Society of Malaysia, the GPSM, where she is the director and serves as a model for the society by leading by example and conservation actions. 
Mariani actively promotes the GPSM to governmental and non-governmental organizations, both national and regionally. The overall goals of GPSM are to create the first small apes rehabilitation pro project in Malaysia following international standards. And the GPSM is delivering programs that address wildlife population declines, especially gibbons, by directly supporting conservation efforts and habitat protection. Mariani is truly a leader in efforts to protect the gibbons of Malaysia. Now she's having connection problems. She's suffering through some heavy rainfall. She is in the screen here. Um, and um, Jennifer, could you please start Mariani's presentation? Yep. Hi everyone. My name is Mariani Ramli, AKA BAM. I am the president for Gibbon Conservation Society and also the project director for Gibbon Rehabilitation Project Malaysia. I would like to show my gratitude to the American Society of Primatologists for choosing me as the Conservationist Award winner on 2018. From the award money, we managed to build the introduction cage as you can see behind me. So introduction cage is really useful to help gibbons in the rehabilitation process because these gibbons, they never meet other gibbons before and we don't want to put them together out of a sudden without a proper introduction because they can fight with each other, they can kill each other and they can freak out with, with each other. So this introduction cage is really useful. As we know, according to the IUCN best practice guidelines for gibbons rehabilitation and translocation, socialization is one of the important from seven criteria, one of the important criteria before each individual can be released back to the wild. The gibbons need to know how to communicate with each other, need to talk to each other, they need to interact with each other. So these are the cages that we built. We call them introduction cage. And here you can see Elsa. She's um, six years old gibbons. She's been living, uh, sorry, seven years old. She's been living with human for seven years old and she never met any gibbons and for her, uh, this is Darling, she's six years old. She's also never met any gibbons for six years. And for them, gibbons, like sometimes they feel like a threat. So that is why, be, because like they, they never see their, their own species, right? So that is why we use this introduction cage. Here, as you can see, Elsa freely can, can freely go from her enclosure to this uh, enclosure, this cage, and they will meet in the tunnel here. For now, we still have a, a, a one last barrier. They already uh, one last barrier before we can um, put them all to with put them both together in this enclosure. So we can see the from this um, introduction cage, we can see the prog process, the progress where during the first few days we put Elsa and Darling here. They start fighting. They start showing their uh, back and then they start you know showing um uh, kicking the enclosure and all but slowly we can see they start touching playing and then grooming and now they are like really calm with each other's presence nearby so this is really important and hopefully uh, soon we can open the barrier and we can now we can put them together to socialize with each other so Socialization also one of the most important criteria uh, for enrichment. So they will not feel bored in the enclosure. So they will learn from each other. Thank you, ASP, for giving us the award. What an awesome video. Thank you, Mariani. Nice Thank second. you so much. Yeah, Mariani, just wonderful video. Really appreciate your contributions. Thank you. Thank you. So now it's time for Marilyn to do the next introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Marilyn Norconk. I am past uh, conservation chair for ASP. And I met Bernardo Urbani in 1999 in Lago Guri, Venezuela. He came to the field site where I was working to do a small study on color recognition in primates when he was an undergrad. 
We subsequently had a memorable encounter on the Caracas campus of his university where he was experimenting using radio telemetry to track down a sloth. It was then that I realized just how diverse Bernardo's interests really were. He's currently interested in the history of primatology, primate and nature conservation, cognitive and behavioral ecology of capuchins, and ethno and archaeal primatology. Wow, it's hard to keep up with Bernardo. Uh, he received his PhD in 2009 at the University of Illinois with extended training in Spain, Italy, and Greece. He resides in Caracas, Venezuela, and conducts research at the Venezuelan Institute for Scientific Research. Bernardo received the Conservationist Award in 2010 and the ASP Early Career Achievement Award in 2016. He's published over 100 articles, books, and reports. I'm honored to welcome Bernardo to the panel and excited to hear what's going on in Venezuela. Bernardo um, is with us, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I have, I'm going to play a video because Bernardo's had a bit of laryngitis. So, um, yeah. Thanks, Marilyn. Good morning. My name is Bernardo Urbani anthropologist of the Venezuelan Institute for Scientific Research. And I'm going to talk about three ideas on why to preserve forests under primates. Three ideas about primate conservation that I have in my mind from a long time ago. Number one, long time ago when I was a kid, I recall when my father came from the field with a crystal cross from the cave of the Venezuelan Guayana. And I recall that it, had ended, it ended to be a new mineral in the world what I remember the most is that he, he referred to this mineral as something that was particularly beautiful when he found it. I used to go with him to the field and I remember when he talked to, to his student about the beauty of the shapes and forms of the, of the, of the rocks, like the one in this slide. Later, he was a lead author of the Venezuelan geological map, the most recent one. And I remember looking at his eye, and he was not looking at a map, he was looking like a piece of art, like looking at Matisse, like looking at Monet. He said that science, in a sense, is art. I agree. I used to go to the field doing primatological surveys, and I was very lucky to see images like this one, that are especially beautiful the beauty of nature, sort of art of the nature. Similar happened with the primates that I was able to see. Like this white-faced sake from the Venezuelan Guayana, my first pick of a primate, or my favorite ape, an orangutan from Sumatra. Similar happened in Venezuela, when, in the people from Caracas, that the capital city of Venezuela, that when we think in our city, we think in the national park that is in the north, El Ávila, is this mountain that flank the city. We see the Caracanos, the people from Caracas, we see this mountain as the lung of the city. It purified there. Also, we always talk about this mountain because it's very beautiful. It is actually a coffee a topic during the coffee time in the mornings in our jobs. We talk about the beauty of that mountain. When we travel abroad, we bring with us a picture of that mountain or a, or a painting of that mountain and we put it in our living room. Why? Because it's beautiful. That that image, that, 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 that painting or that, photo, or that photograph do not provide, do, do not provide uh, environmental service, but they, 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 they provide us ple with pleasure, the pleasure of something that is beautiful, and we love that. So the first reason why to preserve primates at the forest because they have an intrinsic aesthetic and sensorial value because forests and primates are beautiful. I guess I'm not the first one saying something similar, because before, Kinji Manishi captured the essence of, of nature in his book, Sebutsu no Sekai, The World of the Living Thing, that I would strongly recommend 
to all private conservation is too risk. Too risk. Number two. When I was an undergrad student to find literature on primates in Spanish was different. Like this one, a book on apes from Western Africa published by the pioneer of Spanish primatology, Jorge Salvatore P. I was able to find John Thurber's book and uh, the library of my institute got the, at that time the recent book of Warren King's New World Primates. I was able to look at the, my favorite journal of anthropology, uh, like this paper from a, a guy named P.A. Garber from Illinois. So I have all these rings in my mind, merging and then all within the dynamic of the dynamic of the forest. How important are the forest um, for our life, for our survival of humanity? And now there is a fancy name for that, the one health, one health approach. Our health of humans depends on the health of the environment and depends on the health of animals. When I see this monkey, a white-faced capuchin monkey, like this one from Costa Rica, what I see is a sentinel. A sentinel that tells me that the dynamic of the forest is doing well. I mean, at least in, in, in principle, it's doing well. And this is good. So the reason number two is the one health approach. Because by saving the forest and the prime, we humans are saving ourselves. By doing so, we're by doing so, we're saving the whole organ primates together. So the time to do it is right now. We cannot wait. Number three. Again, when we go to the field, the animal that we see or that what or what we hear that look quite a lot are horror monkeys, this beautiful relative big monkeys, uh, reddish monkeys that are in the forest of my country. But when I was an undergrad, I did my degree in anthropology, but with a major in archaeology. And because I was also an uh, active member of the Venezuelan Speleological Society, I was able to recheck a collection of an excavation, an archaeological excavation that was conducted in the entrance of the major cave of Venezuela. And there were a lot of, of remains of horror monkeys there, possibly hunted in the past by indigenous people. In my mind, that idea was there for many years about the interface between humans and non-human primates in the, in the past. I was very fortunate to be invited to publish on that in the Annual Review of Anthropology, my favorite anthropology journal. Uh, there are many issues that arise from that paper, but one of them, one of them is that non-human primates were represented in locations where there are not national where there are no national population of them, like in Egypt, in Mongolia, or in the island of Crete, or even, or even in the desert of, of, of Peru. Another trend is that in some part of the world there are a, let's say a higher concentration of, of concentration of primate remains in in the so archaeological record. And we were able then we were able to detect uh, ten, 10 hotspots or three regions or three or ten regions of the world that uh, that presents such concentration of non-human primates in archaeological sites. Among among them, number four and number five, as you can see, are not located within the range of natural population of primates. So the reason number three is because humans culturally interacted with non-human primates since long, long time ago. Because forests and primates are closely related to humans from prehistoric times, then by looking at the past, we can find clues to determine the future of this interconnection. So to finish, I would like to thank the people that was there during my primatological past, especially Marilyn Norcom and Leon Arbello when I was an undergrad student. And I thanks, thanks so much. I would like to dedicate this presentation to my father, Frank Urbani, who teaches me everything about the field, doing field work, and Paul Garner, that PA Garner from the Annual Review of Anthropology, well, he later became my PhD advisor. He's like the best advisor ever, the best friend, and I'm very proud to be a Garberian now. So thanks, Paul, for your teaching. I'm glad that you are now. So, as such a 
primate, such a great primatologist working in primate conservation. Thanks so much for all your attention once more. I appreciate your attention. Thanks, Bernardo. Thank you. One more wonderful presentation. Uh, very impressive, Bernardo. Really appreciated that. And so now it's time for um, introduction of Fernanda Abra and um, Marilyn or Trimmy. I think Trimmy's going to do the introduction, correct? Yes, I think take, so. it, take <laughs> it away. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Trimmy Gregory. I am a research scientist at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. And it's a huge honor for me today to uh, introduce Fernanda Abra. I met Fernanda in two, 2019. Uh, she gave a presentation to the center where I work at the Smithsonian. And I said, I need to work with this woman. One way or the other, I have to find a way. So I, um, I said, well, maybe, maybe we could see if, if you could win a fellowship at the Smithsonian. Uh, and she was able to. They're very coveted fellowships. And, and she won a one-year fellowship that she actually started uh, only in August because um, of the pandemic. It was delayed for a year, but now I'm excited to say that she's in the field as we speak, and she's installing the canopy bridges that we're going to talk about today, and uh, I'm extremely grateful to ASP for recognizing her important conservation work for primates, and um, and yeah, I, I guess you can say that she's, she's very much uh, taking advantage of the opportunity by using the funds to, to create solutions for primates. Um, she uh, was awarded her PhD in 2019 from the University of Sao Paulo and her master's in 2012. Um, she is one of just a small handful of Brazilian road ecologists that are creating solutions for both terrestrial and arboreal wildlife in a country where, as we all know, um, it's of utmost importance, uh, the home of the, the vast majority of the area of the Amazon. Uh, she's also a founder of a uh, of Via Fauna, which is an institution focused on the management of wildlife along roads, and she's been involved in over 50 uh, road projects across Brazil. Once again, I'd like to say I'm honored to work with her and very grateful to ASP for recognizing her contribution uh, to primatology and for um, making her a member of this very very honorable group. I'm, I'm, I'm extremely excited to be able to work with her and to hear from all the rest of the former uh, Conservationist Award winners today. So she'll, we'll be hearing a recording from her. I was in touch with her last night at midnight and she said she was gonna try to connect depending on how her connect, connection was, but um, I think she wasn't able to connect, but, um, but just know that she's, she's not here because she's doing important conservation work. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Tremi. I was uh, I got to talk to Fernanda just yesterday and get her presentation. So I'll pull that up for everybody. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Fernanda Abra. I'm from Brazil and I'm currently a postdoc researcher at the Smithsonian Center for Conservation and Sustainability. Today, I'm going to present to you about the Reconecta project. We know the world is constantly changing and road expansion is a major threat to forest and wildlife. The impact of highways on terrestrial fauna is well documented around the world However, we do not know very well about the impacts of highways and traffic on strictly arboreal species, such as New World primates. By 2050, more than 25 million kilometers of new highways are planned, most of them in tropical ecosystems with high biodiversity, such as the Amazon. For strictly arboreal and some sconsorial species that normally avoid descending to the ground level and that avoiding moving across open areas, loss of, connect loss of cannot connectivity is especially det detrimental. On the other hand, 
Species that are willing to descend to the ground level and they are willing to cross open areas such as roads and highways are exposed to potential collisions with vehicles. The Reconnecta project is a research and applied conservation project. Our study area is a specific highway in Brazilian Amazon called BR-174 that crosses the states of Amazonas and Roraima. The Waimiria Troari indigenous territory has been severely affected by the construction of this road. We have three main activities in Reconnecta project. First, we want to understand how the impact of roads affects population of different species of primates and other arboreal species by monitoring road queue at this road for at least two years. Our second activity is to implement third canopy bridges, testing two types of bridge design. We're going to see if these bridges help to reduce road mortality and increase functional and structural, structural connectivity. In this slide, you can see we're going to install one single rope and ro one rope lattice per pair of posts. Our third activity is to monitor the canopy bridges for at least two years. For that purpose, we're going to use two camera traps for each bridge. One camera will be installed on the one side of the canopy bridge, pointing towards it and recording animal use. The other camera will face away from the road at the level of the forest canopy, recording animals that approach the bridge. In conjunction with the data from the other camera, this data will allow for the calculation of an exception radio for each canopy bridge and test for potential differences between the two designs. There are more than 20 species that we can benefit from these bridges. Some of them threaten or with their populations in decline. It is the indigenous people who choose the location of the canopy bridges. They have accumulated knowledge of where the priority areas for bridge installation have been for decades. Well, I am immensely happy to have received the ASP 2021 Conservationist Award. This is an award I share with my colleagues at the Center for Conservation and Sustainability at Smithsonian. I am very, very lucky to be able to count on such serious researchers and institutions from all around the world. I also thank to ASP for giving this award to Brazil. It will benefit a conservation project that uses cutting-edge scientific research in balance with traditional knowledge of an Amazon indigenous tribe. As a road ecologist and part of Smithsonian Center for Conservation and Sustainability team, I want to continue to create smart and cost-effective strategies to reduce fragmentation and road mortality impacts of roads around the world for the next years. With the ASP award feature, we're going to be able to buy two posts of canopy bridges. So if you are watching this presentation recorded and not alive, it means I am at the field installing the posts right now. Thank you so much for everyone's attention. So one more excellent presentation. What an impressive group of people. Uh, I'm really in awe of all this, this, these conservation activities. So um, that's the end of our presentations. Now we have almost 30 minutes for uh, question and answers. And, um, and just a reminder, we've had uh, people join us from Singapore, from Malaysia, from Uganda, from Madagascar, from Brazil, um, from Venezuela. So uh, just an amazing um, range of examples of, of impressive conservation work being done by 
a habitat country primatologist. Let's see now. Um, in terms of questions, should we do raise hands? I'm looking in chat here to see um, if some questions have come in. I'm seeing lots and lots of congratulatory um, comments here. Yeah, we haven't had too many specific questions yet. We had one about internships and jobs for working with primates and getting some more experience. Um, and Eric uh, shared a resource um, about that. But I think for specific speaker questions, folks might have been waiting till the end. Um, yeah. I put a couple of uh, general questions to Bert a little bit ago, but maybe um, we could ask any of the attendees to give us a little bit of um, a sense for what COVID, ha how COVID has impacted uh, your research. Obviously, um, it has been a global impact and a very serious one for primates. But do any of the attendees would like to uh, talk about a little bit more depth about how COVID has impacted your work? Andy, are you uh, signaling us? <laughs> I, can, I can go first. Um, for Singapore, I think we experienced the um, more severe effects of the pandemic and the lockdown sometime in April 2020. Um, so for us um, researchers working on the Bennett Angus, we were kind of fortunate that we started to do the tree climbing at the beginning of kind of 2020, um, setting up the 12 cameras, along the roads and on trees along the roads and also within the habitat. And so in a way, during uh, the lockdown, the cameras were still there collecting data for us. Um, it was only sometime, I think, um, the fourth quarter of last year that we could actually go out to resume our field work. And we wanted to, you know, check the cameras. Um, but because of manpower restrictions and certain activities that the National Parks Board will allow for us to do, we actually only managed to check the camera sometime um, middle of this year. So the cameras were there for nearly, I would say one, some, some of them one and a half years. Um, when we managed to check the cameras, uh, most of them, half of them were destroyed by the dusky langers. But the other half had footages that uh, were running, some of them continuously for a couple of months. And so they were valuable data, even though we were not out there. So, yeah. So a lot of data to analyze at this point. From the <laughs> cards. A lot of the, also like trees and the branches and the leaves <laughs> going through right. them one by one. Uh -huh. yeah. Mariani, you have your hand up. Hi, everyone. Oh. Um, First, I would like to say thank you for including me in this webinar and also for you guys out there for joining and listening to our presentation. Um, the COVID really affect us, um, of course, from the funding wise, because of the, you know, public donations suddenly stopped when the first lockdown struck. And also for manpower, our volunteers cannot come in, especially from the international, but um, slowly, you know, um, slowly we managed to adapt, but but still we can uh, we are facing the difficulties. It's just is um is a challenge for us where because of we need to stretch our funds, we need to venture more into the jungle to find the gibbons food. And for me, uh, COVID is a challenging situation. Also, it it also from the, I can say a bit positive side, it um, helped us to think and be more creative of to, uh, about how to adapt with the situation. Thank you. William? Oh, hi, um, the COVID-19 um, uh, 
couldn't allow us to work. But even then, um, uh, well, the, we had a lockdown and it was not possible to do any field work. But again, on another level, it, it's been really a challenge to raise um, funding during this time. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, I, with the government promising to open up all activity uh, effective beginning of next year, hopefully, it should be possible to go back to the field again and, and do some work. That's all I have to say about the COVID. Thanks, William. Sylvia, did you have a question? I did not. I just can't oh. get that. <laughs> <laughs> that's OK. I did have a question about the bridges, but I don't think that speaker is here, right? So go uh, ahead. Yeah. Fernanda's not, but Tremi, I think, is still with us um, and might be able to answer your question. Uh, Tremi, I, I wasn't at the last seminar on bridges, but I am very interested in, in that. Um, have we seen, um, can, you, can you speak to us about the comparison of before and after um, the bridges, what we saw before in terms of, I guess we would call it roadkill and, and after? Um, yeah, for, for Fernanda's project in particular, she, uh, the bridges are actually just going in today, so we don't have a lot of information before, but she has seen, she's done, uh, she does five day surveys every month. She started in September, she did the next one in October, uh, and it's over a 350 kilometer piece of road every day. She drives that 350 kilometer piece and looks for uh, road killed animals. And she's seen over something like over 120 road kills in those two assessments, only two assessments that she's done so far. Um, plenty of primates, um, a lot of other arboreal species. You saw the golden-handed tamarins, the howler monkeys, uh, and then lots of terrestrial species. So because arboreal mammals are unlikely to cross on the ground, um, in an underpass or something like that, which terrestrial animals can use, we're hoping that the canopy bridges will provide um, an alternative, a solution, because there are plenty that are crossing and getting hit, but then there are plenty of others that aren't even crossing at all, creating quite a barrier effect. So I hope we'll have results soon. But as I said, we'll have this special issue hopefully coming out next summer. We're just receiving submissions right now. So um, that'll provide a lot of information on what solutions are working and where we have contributions from all across the world, from every continent. So there are solutions not only for primates, but also for other arboreal groups. Thank you, Trami. Thank you so much. It's interesting. It seems that uh, camera traps are becoming the new extension uh, for <laughs> Uh, extending us beyond the ground, uh, particularly for, for primates that are mostly in the trees. Uh, with two out of the six of you working using camera traps, they certainly seem to be um, the extender of the ability for us to observe. And uh, not only, Tremi, um, to observe the species, but as, as uh, Andy noted, um, even to observe new uh, organisms coming into a range where they hadn't been seen before. So I thought that was quite interesting with, with Andy's work. Yeah, there's a lot going on up there that I think it's really hard to document with a couple of binoculars from the ground. Right. Right. And, um, and I think that, I, I mean, and I'm working on a paper right now and we've found over 95% of the activity happening in the canopy that we documented with camera traps happened at night. So um, I, I don't know how many of our, our participants here study nocturnal primates, but I, I haven't done it myself and I can imagine it's an exceedingly difficult thing to do. But um, the fact is that it's possible that in most places, most of the activity is happening at night. And we know that as primatologists looking in binoculars isn't easy, but doing it at night must be extreme, much, much, much more difficult. So it gives us eyes 24 hours a day, all through the night. And um, I think yeah, it has tons of potential and not only potential for 
conservation um, solutions and, and understanding natural history, but also in sharing our experience in studying primates with the public and providing, you know, the video and the images. I gave a talk to my my son's kindergarten class um, last week, and and all of these kids that maybe never get to go to the Amazon get to see images of of animals that they got extremely excited about. Each one of them had questions, so that was really exciting. Thank you. Quite interesting. Um, you know, it's past midnight in uh, Singapore and Malaysia, where two of our speakers are. Um, it's early in the workday for a number of us across the United States, or midday, and other time zones um, in, in Africa and Madagascar. Uh, so let me just jump in here and provide some summarizing statements. And then if people want to hang around for additional questions, that would be possible. So. Uh, once again, a, a big congratulations to Andy, William, Mammy, Mariani, Bernardo, and Fernanda. Such impressive work documenting that they are worthy recipients of the Conservationist Award. And a big thanks to Jennifer Kramer for all the behind the scenes actions that allow the webinar to, to go off. That uh, uh, I've struggled over the last 18 months uh, to learn how to do Zooms and, um, and I've have failed to master all the things that she has been successful at mastering. Um, and a reminder, this webinar is a production of the American Society of Primatologists Conservation Committee. And we encourage all who are able to donate to the Saving Primates Where They Live campaign. With your donations, we'll be able to continue to support conservation efforts around the world. And I know that all of you here in the audience um, have been impressed with what we've heard from our speakers today and they are emblematic of the sorts of work that in-country uh, primatologists are doing. And I'm sure that uh, most of you will agree with me also that um, non-habitat country scientists, such as myself, um, we are quite fortunate uh, to be able to um, partner with these people. Um, and I know that uh, having worked with Andy in the field some that um, I'm, I'm truly honored that um, my friends and colleagues like Andy allow me to tag along and participate in field work on occasion. Um, that um, as is evident from the presentations, um, all these people are, are exemplary ex examples of conservationists in action, uh, highly talented people. And a reminder to all of us that people around the world, all of us are equal in capabilities and potentials. And our ability to support people, uh, Habitat Country Scientists, um, is, is not only um, efficient in terms of energy, but it's simply the right thing to do. Um, so again, uh, we've got the links in the chat here on how you can donate. Um, I hope that those who are able will donate. And um, once again, um, join me in thanking all of our presenters for such um, interesting, impressive, um, and uh, meaningful uh, examples of conservation in action. So thanks to our speakers. Now, I know that some of you need to, to go on to work, and maybe some want to go on to bed. Um, but are there any um, additional questions that we'd like to share with our speakers, or post our speakers? I'm gonna ask one last question for the participants. So this comes from um, Marilyn. Uh, what do you consider to be the, the most challenging conservation uh, issues that you face in your region right now? So Andy, is there a, a singular challenge in Singapore you think for conservation? What what's the top of your list? I think at the moment, um, I'm seeing, I would say, like an increase in terms of uh, encounters between people and wild animals, in the sense that because you know we can't really travel overseas for the past two years, and so Singaporeans are actually going to our nature reserves and nature parks to enjoy themselves, and in the process, they encounter animals. And also because of um, deforestation and developments, we are losing a lot of the forests. So animals are also coming out. 
So we're talking about monkeys, like long-term macaques, the otters, the wild pigs, snakes, hornbills. And so I think for right now, one of the biggest challenge, challenges would be to manage uh, the interactions between human and wildlife such that you know, they don't actually um, cow the animals or result in actually injuries in people at the same time. Thanks, Andy. Mariani, is there a top challenge in your mind? Hi, Bert. Um, challenges here that we face um, is, um, is to make people understand the importance of proper rehabilitation for gibbons and you know to, to stop people for having the gibbons as pet because gibbons is one of the um, uh, having gibbons as pet in Malaysia is one of like a trend here you know for the exotic wildlife owners so that is our biggest challenge here to stop the 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 gibbons um, trade and also to encourage people to support for gibbons rehabilitation yeah that's our challenges here thank you mariani that it's so important to um, provide conservation education to the public and um, again really impressive work william you have a top challenge for conservation um, sure, I think I highlighted it in the presentation, and um, this uh, habitat loss. Um, pretty much there is uh, an onslaught on all kinds of habitats, whether they are protected, or whether they occur outside areas that are reserved for biodiversity. Uh, the pressure is on, so that's the major challenge for primates, the, and then there's the fallout of, of conflict. Yeah, and that is that that's that's the, the problem. But the root cause is um, habitat loss. But um, other than that, um, the, the, that's what we what we need to respond to is habitat loss. Then, even if we have a wish list of things we like to do, then the challenge, you know, how do you do it? Yeah, it's always uh, the, 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 the challenge of raising funds for for conservation work, and that's the main one. Thank you, William. Thank you. Uh, Mammy? Yes, uh, thank you, Bert. Uh, in my side, it's a bit uh, uh, different as uh, Madagascar is uh, uh, because of the poverty first. And uh, the uh, local community relies on the natural uh, resources for their uh, to survive. And uh, in the in the place where we work, it's a very dry it's a dry forest, and uh, it's become uh, easily to to burn. And uh, people use always uh, uh, some people still use a, a, a burning system to uh, to graze their uh, their cattle, so it may. Uh, burn accidentally the primate uh, habitat. Thank you, Mammy. Uh, Bernardo, is there something you'd like to highlight for a conservation challenge? Yeah, I got some very like, like forest destructions and corruption on um, habitat loss, but I guess that normally if we are in a developing or a developed country, I guess that the principal challenge, in my opinion at least, is awareness. I mean, no matter, I mean, if we are not aware of what, how important are the forests, the, that is the challenge. And I guess some in, people need to know how, <clears throat> how important is the forest. So awareness, awareness, awareness about the role of, of the forest. Every time we, no matter where we are, where we eat a candy bar, there's something behind. And we need to think about that. that <clears throat> that's my, my idea, that we, we need to think uh, in the forest. Um, but awareness, I think, is the key, maybe. 
Thank you, Bernardo. That um, certainly that resonates. That um, and it overlaps with some of the other comments, Mariani's, for example, in terms of just um, educating the public about the importance of 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 conservation, the importance of the forest, uh, the importance of biodiversity more generally, and uh, and again that uh, listening to each of you speak today, that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm honored um, to have been able to hear each of these presentations. And, uh, and while each of you provide us um, important messages of challenges, um, you also provide us hope um, that uh, really impressive leadership uh, across range countries, uh, really impressive. So any additional comments, Marilyn, Jennifer, anyone else here? I just put in the chat a note about, you know, I appreciate that ASP has been putting these um, together from the Conservation Committee and that they're posted on YouTube, the talks that we had earlier in the year. Um, this talk will be there. Um, there's also some other short videos from Conservation Award winners. And so using those videos to the extent that you can, if you teach students, if you have a good social network with friends or family, um, leaning on some of these videos can help with awareness and letting people know the important work that primatologists around the world are doing, um, or the important work that our society is doing um, to support folks and support primate conservation. So um, these aren't kind of one and done videos, but our hope is that people can use them to kind of uh, to help Right. Yes, I agree. And thank all of the participants for taking the time uh, to spend with us today and in, in your preparation for your videos. I think it's been great. And I just wanted to add that I think part of building awareness is building positivity because there's a lot of reasons to feel a lack of positivity in the world these days, but but the power of positivity really helps keep people connected and keep people looking for solutions rather than giving up, which is easy to do at a time like this. So um, I think that if we can use the stories we learned about today to, to help keep people excited and connected and full of hope, then there's a reason to be hopeful. I think that's our job as primatologists, conservationists. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Trimmy. And I, I think that the positivity really comes through as we listen to each of the speakers. Um, and it does provide us a reason for hope. So thanks. And I think I'll say thanks to everyone. And um, it's time to bring this to an end. So um, good to see you all. Um, again, uh, thanks to everyone, particularly the presenters. And, um, and until the next webinar. Um, Take care. Thanks, everyone. Hello. Thanks, Good night. all. Everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.